European time, it's 31 past, past one in, n at night. So I hope I'm not uh, as sleepy as you are. Um, I'm going to do a talk on mobile security. So it's a little bit different from wireless security um, that a lot of people are talking about. I'm talking about mobile on my phone. Um, I'm not even so much talking about mobile on my PDA or something. This is um, mostly concerned with mobile phones. Um, in front, it also said, or on the, the list of today, it says also GSM. Um, I won't be talking about GSM very much today. Um, that's uh, a little bit of a mistake. However, I do have uh, some information on GSM with me from uh, Emmanuel Gade, if I pronounce his name right. Um, he was supposed to do a talk here on GSM security, on interception and uh, all the tricks that you can play in GSM networks. Um, so if there's interest, maybe afterwards we can do a quick look at some stuff that's concerned with GSM. Um, however, today I'm only going to talk about SMS and web. Now let's see if this thing is awake. Move. I don't believe you. <laughs> ah, okay. So what I'm going to talk about. Um, first, I want to go a little bit into uh, mobile security. Uh, just the general things that, that spring to mind when you uh, start thinking about security aspects of a mobile device like a telephone. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about, okay, what am I talking about? What are all these terms? Um, and next, there are the two parts. I go into detail about what is SMS, uh, what is web, uh, what are security uh, aspects of it, um, what can you s expect other than what you generally hear on, on uh, security, which is mainly encryption. Um, and then a little bit into the future of what we can expect. So to set a little bit more of the context of the talk, um, as most of you probably know, uh, SMS and web is mostly a European, Asian thing at the moment. Um, I'm not so much informed about the situation in the US. Um, I know that both uh, protocols are not tied to the underlying um, uh, GSM or CDMA or whatever protocols. Um, but if you look at the usage, it's, it's primarily in the, in the European and Asian markets. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the underlying technologies, as I said. Um, I'm also not myself a web implementer or something. I don't build web gateways. I don't build infrastructure. Um, I don't build applications and I don't do security design or any kind of stuff for this kind of market. So um, don't expect advice very much in that area. Uh, although I hope, of course, that, that you can learn something if you're in that area. Um, I'm also not going to demonstrate any exploits. I'm not going to show how um, I have built a virus that will spread to all your phones at this moment. So don't worry. Um, so what will I be talking about? Um, first of all, it's a general perspective. So I'm not going very much into, into one typical exploit that you could uh, uh, create against these technologies. It's more a general perspective of all the issues that are involved. How does it work and where are uh, aspects that are weak of it. Um, how can I talk about something like this? Why would I be a person to talk to you about this? Um, basically, um, just, just as well, uh, I guess for me as for you probably. Um, the only thing that I have is, is about 10 years of experience in, in hacking applications and, and systems. I have a pen test company in Holland, and that's my work. I enjoy it, I like it, and uh, it gives me a certain view on systems where um, I approach it differently than a typical application builder would, or something, uh, someone that wants to do uh, a certain function with a typical application or technique uh, works differently from someone like me who just wants to break it. Um, and I hope to uh, give you some viewpoints of, of areas where you can expect problems, um, where, where there may be problems in the near future when they start rolling out stuff like this, uh, maybe even in the US. 
So um, when would you be interested in a talk like this? Um, my view of, of an audience that I'm trying to reach with this talk is, is people that are interested in uh, or asked to evaluate security of these uh, types of platforms. Um, if you are asked to pen test uh, a web gateway or platform or application, um, generally you need to delve into it uh, pretty much from scratch because no one has done it before. So maybe with some pointers that I'm giving today, uh, you know better where to start. Um, another part is that there's really very little information known on um, the protocols involved and um, the security issues involved because everyone using it at the moment is trying to build stuff with it. They are just happy if it works. I mean, no one cares or has knowledge uh, about the security issues uh, that are potentially there. So what we need is people doing research into it and show what the issues are and, I don't know, maybe even write the exploits for it. So maybe I can reach some of those people. And um, of course, the general public that needs to um, tell people about uh, issues, security issues with these kinds of technologies. So um, if you're asked to advise on, on the uses of these kinds of applications. Okay, mobile security. These are some points that, that I find um, um, or, 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 or how do I say, spring in my eye if I look at the mobile security um, uh, of phones and the way that the, the people that build applications for them and use them um, deal with them. Uh, the first thing is the enormous difficulty with the user interface. Um, everyone is talking about encryption and authentication and that the protocol levels crypto is okay and that it will talk um, uh, to each other in, a, in, in the correct way and that there's no way that you can, you know, put something in there to, to make it break. So, okay, all the lower level protocols are theoretical okay, um, but how is the user ever going to know um, if you have, uh, you know, a screen size of, uh, I don't know, what's it, 20 characters by uh, three or four or five lines? How are you ever going to know that you are talking to the right party? Um, if you even have trouble explaining to people how to use your, their browsers on their Windows PCs. So I think this will be the, the always one of the biggest problems with, with mobile devices. Um, then if we look at the standards um, that people are writing for these kinds of protocols and these kinds of technologies, um, you'll see that they omit, omit all the security issues except for that encryption part or that maybe that authentication part. So um, as soon as it starts to get into the sensitive areas of, uh, uh, I don't know, sessions and session IDs and uh, how to deal with, uh, how to display your information, um, there's no information at all in standards and everyone is free to do whatever he likes, uh, resulting in like uh, 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 100 different implementations and uh, you know intuitive uh, things that are different so no one knows what to trust anymore. Um, and then a third point is that we are creating uh, general purpose platforms all over again with all the associated risks. Um, you know if, if I have uh, a general platform where I can run any code and mobile code and you get all the problems that come with it you know you can't trust anymore, just like your PC, if you're home banking and surfing at the same time, I mean, it's hell. I mean, you, you don't know what you're doing and there's no guarantee at all um, about security. So um, what I see in the mobile world is the same thing. There's no way that um, the platform will ensure uh, correctness or integrity or something like that at all. So these are general mobile issues. Let's go more into the, the protocols and the technologies that uh, I want to talk today about. Um, first of all, you have GSM. Um, GSM is one of the few standards that are out there for mobile phone um, about the lower layer to um, make the connection of your phone. So it's basically um, uh, talking about how the phone is sending its signals, signals to the base station and to a switch, switching center and um, that 
technology to make your call. So it's pretty low level. Um, there are several technologies. GSM is, is big in Europe and in, in Asia. Uh, TDMA and CDMA are two competing uh, style um, uh, implementations here in the US and GSM now slowly coming into the US also. Um, if we talk about SMS, SMS stands uh, has nothing to do with uh, Microsoft, uh, I don't know, management stuff. It's a short messaging service. Um, it's a paging style message. So it's the old uh, style message where you have paging um, in a new format where it's a, it's, it's a, a digital message. Um, Web stands for wireless application protocol and it's uh, pretty much a simplified HTML uh, for small devices. So that's the terms that I'll be using. Um, immediately when you start looking into these protocols, you hit upon standards. Um, there are several, uh, how do you say it, groups or, or platforms or forums uh, involved with uh, writing the standards for these technologies. First, you had the GSM standards. That those were the original standards, I think, 10 years, 15 years ago. Um, they were specified as GSM, and then uh, XX is, is a number, dot another number. Th that's the specification of the documents. Then they moved to the European um, Telecommunications Standards Institute. Uh, they have a special mobile group, so they moved the whole numbering scheme to Etsy and renumbered. So you have now documents with two numbers on them. Um, the Etsy number, and then the old GSM number. And now lately with the UMTS, there's a new uh, um, uh, platform. It's called the uh, uh, Third Generation Partner Program, where um, Etsy is a member, uh, a few Japanese, Korean uh, telecommunication standardization companies or organizations are members, and I think T1 from USA is also a standardization is also a member, and they again uh, introduce a new numbering scheme, moving the Etsy numbering scheme into their numbering scheme, so you have now three numbers for every document. Um, so it's, it's a big heap of documents. Um, and there's a separate, and that's pretty separate, um, standardization, and that's the web forum, which is doing all the standardization for web-related stuff. Um, the most important major releases are Web 1.1 and 1.2. Um, you have now phones uh, in, in both uh, standard levels, and 1.2 of obviously uh, gives you more uh, capabilities and probably more risks also. Okay. Questions so far? That's good. Um, SMS. Um, short overview of the points that I want to walk through with SMS. Um, okay, anyone um, familiar, not familiar with SMS? It's, it's not at all? Okay, it's, um, you have a phone. Um, what you do is you type a phone number, uh, you have write message, you have your keys or your letters, or you can enter your text. Um, pretty nice in the new phones, you have T9, it's a, it's a library, um, uh, encoding kind of thing. It's, um, it predicts what word you want to type from the library uh, dictionary that's in there. So um, you don't type uh, three times a two to get a C. Uh, you just type the letters that, you, that are on the two. So if you want to have uh, uh, a C, you just press once for two. Uh, maybe an A will appear, but if you keep typing, uh, it will find the word that you are looking for and then form the word, so you have less typing. Anyway, so you type on, um, any enter message is done, and you press send, and it sends it off. Um, and then we we'll get to, to how it gets to your phone in a, in a minute. So it's just sending a message. But, and it's also important, it's also used for some signaling to your phone in case of voicemails, for instance. It can be used to indicate a voicemail. It can even be used to indicate uh, email. There are standards that already describe special SMS messages to do that. So, again, um, SMS is a store and forward uh, messaging uh, principle. Um, it's either point to point or a cell broadcast. So it can be like a, a multicast uh, packet. You can send it from a cell and, and all phones get the same message. 
Um, it's delivered through the SS7 uh, signaling between the, the telephone switches. Um, it, it's in a parallel uh, signaling to the normal call. So if you're calling, uh, you can still receive SMS messages in parallel. Um, it's 150 bytes data, but uh, normally the, co the, the, the coding scheme is 7-bit, so you get uh, 160 characters. So that's a normal size for an SMS message. Um, maximum and you can send basically from anywhere uh, you can send from your own phone but there are also uh, all kinds of interfaces to the to the central point that sends the SMS the, the SMS surfacing uh, center and that can be a PC dial in uh, x25 uh, TCP IP um, whatever so there are all kinds of interfaces to the SMS uh, centers um, and as I said, you can find all the specifications of the internals at Etsy. So if you look at a, um, a little scheme of the network, um, by the way, I, all the pictures that you see in my presentation, I stole all over the place from all kinds of documents, so I, I don't know whose this is. Um, what you see is uh, the blue things um, are the uh, uh, short message entities, so there's the mobile phones. Uh, they connect to the uh, uh, SMSC, the, the service center, um, which has a connection to the mobile switching center, MSC, which is doing a lookup, uh, and this is already very tied to the GSM level, where it does a lookup in the, in the home uh, location register, which is a big database that says who's the subscriber, uh, where he is at the moment. Um, and then the SSS, uh, SS7 signaling uh, uses that information to route the message to the end user or stores it if, if he's not online at the moment, not in the air. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, so now I'm going a little bit into the data format. Um, there are the main types, the basic types that you have is, is SMS deliver, which is uh, the format of an SMS message as it arrives in your phone when someone has sent someone. Uh, has sent a message to you. Um, that can be a report of a successful uh, reception. Um, the same way as the other way around, the submit message is the one that you submit from your phone to the network, um, and you can get a report back in how it's progressing through the network, if it's pending or if it's been uh, received by the recipient. Um, and then there are some comments and status things uh, uh, to see how, how the message is. And why is that? Because you can have like overlapping a SMSs. You can send an SMS and you can send an SMS with, it s with the same ID later and it will can be overridden. So that's an, um, an option that you can have. So you can have like updates and if the message is no longer valid, then there's no need to deliver it anymore. So it gets overridden with a new one. Um, so if we look in detail, uh, and I hope this is a bit readable, um, it's a whole list of, of fields that, that in get set in a uh, submit message. And I just want to go over it and talk a little bit about issues because um, it took too much to, to split this all out. But there are interesting uh, fields uh, in there. Um, the first thing is the, the message type indicator. OK, that's uh, um, a, a pretty uh, simple thing. It's, it's not so important for this uh, explanation. Um, the reject dupl duplicates is, has to do with sending multiple messages with the same ID. Um, then you have a validity period format. Um, you can set the validity period. So the message uh, maybe cannot be delivered in like a day, then it may be discarded by the SMSC. Um, later on, there's a validity period field, and that can be absolute or it can be um, relative to the current time, for instance. So there's a format field. Then there's an interesting field, it's a reply path. Um, what can happen is that you can force the recipient to use uh, the SMSC that delivers uh, this message for you also to be the returning SMSC. So um, it's a bit like um, uh, strict uh, uh, routing, um, source routing. So you, you can set the way it should be replied. Um, I'll get back to that later. Um, then you have user data header indicator. Um, this is a field I'll get back to in the next uh, few slides. Um, there's a, a separate 
header field that can specify special information about what type of message this is. Um, so the normal use is to send, you know, hello, I'm, uh, I, I will be home later or something. Um, but you can also send ringtones. Uh, in in uh, Europe, one of the killer applications at the moment for SMS is the ability to send ringtones, uh, logos to other people, and you can compose your own. And so you have now the, 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 the top 20 in ringtones, and um, people pay like a dollar for them. I mean, it costs a dollar for you to get sent a ringtone to you, and there are subscription services uh, going on. So, and those are more, much more complicated. They contain binary data, and um, user data header is, is used for that. Um, status report request is to signal that you want to know what's happening with your message. Um, message reference is the number that you gave to it, so you can identify this message uh, for later purposes. Uh, the destination address is um, the phone number that you want to send to, uh, but there's a whole numbering plan, so there are also other possibilities uh, to send. Um, protocol identifier, uh, I'll skip for a moment. Uh, the data coding scheme, uh, this is uh, uh, telling what kind of format is this message. So is it 8-bit or is it 7-bit encoding? But it's also for uh, telling if this is an indication that there's voicemail waiting for you or if there's an indication that there's a fax waiting for you. Uh, it has all these options to uh, uh, identify what kind of message it is for you. Um, another interesting uh, thing is that there's one uh, option there to set so-called flash SMS. Flash uh, SMS is SMS that doesn't say message received, do you want to see? No, it's immediately displayed. So you don't get an option to say I don't want to see it or something. Um, can be interesting if it's, uh, uh, you know, a malicious uh, SMS. Um, okay, validity period I talked about, and then you have user data length and the user data, which is the rest. Um, for deliver, um, it's more or less a mirror. Um, what you'll see is, is uh, in the original and in, in the submit, um, go back, there was no originating address or something. So the originating address is determined in the SMSC. Um, there's no way for you in your phone to set another uh, originating address. So uh, the SMS uh, level takes care of that in this case. Um, what you'll see in the, in the deliver is uh, the opposite thing. You see the originating address in, in this message. Um, for the rest, they are the same. Uh, more messages to send um, uh, can mean uh, is, is part of uh, concatenation uh, possibilities. Uh, I'll get back to that. Um, status report indication um, is all the same. Is there another one I want to talk about? Oh, the reply path indicator. Um, this is the one that um, if it's set in the sender, and there are some rules for the SMSC to modify this a bit maybe, um, but what I've seen is they let it through, and um, that means that in the end, the, the recipient gets this flag, and if it's true, it depends on the phone if it uses it. Um, what I've seen is that my phone will use it uh, without asking. So um, if you have uh, a rogue SMSC, It's okay. Whoops. Uh, I'll keep it somewhere here. <laughs> test, test. Test, test, test. Yeah, it is better. Okay. Um, where was I? Reply path indicator. Anyway, okay. So um, 
if, if you manage to send an SMS, uh, get it on the network with um, uh, the wrong uh, SMSC address, um, then you'll get uh, the possibility to intercept the reply to this message. And why is it interesting? Um, a whole lot of systems are doing uh, challenge response kind of stuff with SMS. So um, if you can intercept the reply, uh, the whole thing becomes much more interesting than if you can only spoof uh, SMS. But I'll get back to that uh, in a later bit. Um, okay, there's timestamp stuff that's not so interesting. Um, okay, I will said I would get back to the user data header. Um, so how does it work? It's, um, it's, it's like a concatenated field, basically. You have a total length, and then you have the length of the header. Um, the, every um, element in the header has a type field that says what it is. Uh, it has a length. And then it, it has some parameters. So uh, you can have like uh, several concatenated to it next to each other, and they get interpreted in the phone and acted upon, and then something may happen. Um, the interesting part, of course, of the, of the user data header is the um, types of fields. What can you do with it? Um, first of all, you can co concatenate the messages. Um, you have uh, the possibility to chain them together and uh, send them as like fragmented packets in, in IP. Um, of course, you can get all the, the difficulties that you have with uh, fragmented packets in uh, IP space. It's uh, starvation attacks, uh, resource problems. Um, if you send like uh, 254 messages to your phone and don't send the last one, um, you won't see anything in your phone, but they will be in your phone. Only with the last packet, the whole thing gets wrapped together and you know, your ringtone arrives. So, uh, and you can send these messages even with like, uh, at least to my phone, it's a Nokia, um, with uh, just character based. So you don't even need the whole header stuff. Um, the Nokia will even do uh, interpretation of um, the, the ASCII content of the message and also interpret it as if it were user data header. So, um, it's pretty uh, uh, strange way. There's no uh, indication on what timeouts there are, how the resource allocation will be if, if there's not enough memory anymore in your phone. So I have no idea how it works, uh, yet I've not sent uh, enough messages to, f to fill it up. Um, so what do more do you have? Um, SMS mess indication is not so interesting. Uh, what is interesting is the 8-bit port and the 16-bit port. Um, these uh, fields are used to make an SMS message more or less like a UDP packet. Um, and a bit later we'll get in the web area, there's a tie there too. Um, but what, is, uh, what it's used for is um, all these uh, services that they build on SMS like ringtones and logos and bookmarks and I don't know what. Uh, they are actually services listening on a port. So what you do is you send uh, a message to that port number and then the service in your phone will take this message and start interpreting uh, what it is uh, according to what service it is on that port. So you have actually uh, got um, uh, a ringtone service listening on port, I don't know, 1581 or something. Um, so it's, it's a bit like the IP equivalent. Uh, Okay, then you have some SMC control parameters. That's not so interesting. Um, there's also a field WCMP, which is related to web, which is also funny. So now suddenly you get in SMS specs, GSM specs that has nothing to do with web, uh, suddenly specifications that um, are needed by web. Um, so what, why the link to web? Um, Web is doing, normally it's doing UDP. So your phone is just talking IP and doing uh, WDP, which is really UDP. Um, but SMS can also be a bearer for web. And in that case, uh, all the packets that are going back and forth are SMS messages, and they, are, they act like um, UDP packets. So you get the same thing with ports, only then they are for the web services. Um, but they needed uh, an ICMP equivalent, so they call it WCMP. And 
uh, invented a field for it in the SMS message also. Um, so, and if you get back down, then we have the SIM toolkit. Uh, I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, and then some specific use for phones. So this is pretty much the most interesting part of the SMS message. This is the part where um, you really get applications working with the message, interrupting the message, um, and bound to make mistakes with the message. Um, I talked about ringtones and logos. Um, it's really, uh, at the moment, a spec between Nokia and Ericsson. Um, what they do is uh, that they have this specification which is also a bit fake and a bit proprietary and uh, it's using the, the services that I, I mentioned. Um, it's also doing the business cards so you can have your, uh, you know, your friends and uh, his telephone number and, and his address and then you can send it over an SMS and it will be immediately interpreted by your phone, added to your phone book. So what you get is you see the message on your phone and the only thing that you can do is view. Uh, mostly you, you have only limited uh, information, so you don't get all the information, uh, a name or something. And then you can say accept or discard, that's all. And you can't move on. You can't say, okay, maybe later. No, at that point you say accept, discard, and if you discard, it's gone. Um, accept, it's go in, and then you can use your phone normally again. Um, what they're also sending is configurations for, uh, for web. Uh, web needs a whole set of settings to work properly. Um, uh, specifically, you need uh, a, an IP for the uh, web gateway, you need a telephone for the dial-in, you need a username and password for uh, access control, um, and all the uh, and, uh, starting URL, and all that information is a lot of work to type in for users, so they do like remote provisioning for the phones, um, specified uh, over the air, with, that's, that's what OTA, o OTA means, and uh, let you send SMSs that configure your phone for all these settings. And again, all you'll see is a name that you gave to it. Um, so if you send a message with one of the major providers and say uh, major provider update, and you send it to all the users, uh, all they're gonna do is say, uh, okay, accept, and override their settings with your gateway, your phone number, your login, uh, and you're in the man in the middle. Um, so again, it's not so much all the, the deep technological stuff below it, but it's the user interface that's a big problem. Um, okay. Okay, a little bit about this short message service center. Um, as I said, it plays a big role in, in where the message goes. Um, the, the mobile phone or the GSM modem is not the only way to interact with that uh, service center. There are a couple of companies that are quite big in, in the SMC world, uh, CMG, Nokia, uh, Sima, Logica. Um, they all made their own SMC, um, and of course they all made their own access protocols. So you have like uh, a, a, now a document that's in the uh, GSM spec um, world that uh, lists all these protocols as appendices uh, um, to have all the different people using all the different gateways uh, be able to talk to them. Um, it's pretty weird and it's again pretty much of a problem uh, that there are so many and there are so many configuration issues that uh, there's a whole bunch of possibilities. Um, I looked mostly at the CMG uh, and at, um, let me see, the CIMA one. Um, and what's funny is that these uh, protocols are also used for the general public to do, you know, PC style modem um, uh, uploads of, uh, of SMS messages. So someone that doesn't have an SMS phone still wants to use SMS services. Uh, you have an analog dial-in and you can just send your message. Uh, what they do is they have these proprietary um, uh, tools to do that, um, but underneath they, they speak the full protocol uh, of these uh, SMSCs. Um, and it's pretty nice because you can specify all these fields that I was talking about uh, with your own custom software, uh, including source, address, because these uh, protocols uh, don't speak the, the precise submit message. Uh, what they do is, um, uh, you know, speak a bit of a higher level uh, like your phone would, 
or like the, the GSM layer would. And it would allow you to set uh, source, source addresses. So you can um, you know, set any address that you want and spoof uh, SMS messages uh, as anyone. Um, but you can also do all the tricks with uh, you use a data header and, and you can fiddle with the bits and uh, it's, uh, it's pretty fun. And you can also have uh, more adv advanced features that you don't have if you have a phone. Um, what you can have in uh, the CMG is you c can send a message to someone and have a notification sent to a third person. So you can uh, have a spoofed message and you get a notification that your spoofed message went to the right person and was received. So. Um, I think that the, the problem with these uh, protocols is again, uh, there are also access uh, controls defined. Um, some parts you can only do if you're, uh, you know, have a certain password, most is password, username, password protection. Um, but again, all the operators need to do all the configuration. Uh, there are so many uh, different that no one uh, precisely knows uh, the functions and a lot of mistakes will be made. Um, a completely different thing. Um, every GSM phone is equipped with uh, a SIM, a uh, subscriber identity module, which is basically the smart card that's in the phone. Um, the smart card in the phone uh, holds some of the secrets so that you, know, you can be uh, securely identified to the network. Um, but it's a smart card, so hey, you can do a lot more with a smart card. Uh, smart cards are nice. Uh, there's a whole uh, standard for how you can write stuff into it and read from it and protect it with pin codes. Um, and it's a temper resistant, so it's a, it's a nice thing. Why not use it for more? So one of the things that they came up with is uh, an API and a, and a protocol to talk uh, to the SIM. Um, and for even for the SIM to talk to the phone. So you can have dynamic menus in your SIM card and the SIM card can tell the phone, hey, display this menu for me. Um, it's pretty extensive and, and maybe that's not all that spectacular, but one part is that you can uh, talk that protocol over SMS to your phone. So why did they do this? Um, they wanna have operators be able to um, update their user base uh, with these dynamic menus. So they have a new surface and they can write in your phone a new menu and you'll have that new surface in your phone. Um, there is a protection with pin codes and a secret that the uh, uh, operator needs to know or even with cryptographic uh, signatures if the SIM card would uh, support it. Um, all in all, they, they did think about security but um, the scary part is that what happens if uh, the card hasn't been protected properly. If someone chose to write some information without a PIN code. Um, the protocol goes so far that you can write uh, app do, uh, APDUs, which are um, on smart card level, you know, the, the command strings, directly from an SMS. So you fully control what you can send from an SMS to a smart card. Um, again, uh, sometimes hardly with the user knowing what's happening. So, so the risks are that, that um, all the mistakes that are made in SIM cards uh, become remote risks. Um, and I've heard from uh, a, a bank in, I think, Finland uh, that was using um, credit card information in the SIM and they just wrote it in, in a field, in an elementary field, but didn't protect it. So uh, with this kind of technology, you can now read that uh, data from the SIM card remotely. Okay, some uh, threats that you can see uh, with SMS. Um, spam, that's one of the m things that we really see in Europe now is, is uh, just people getting spammed now in their phones. Um, last year with uh, New Year's, uh, on New Year's Eve, everyone received an SMS message uh, from one of the big uh, phone companies. Uh, Hi, please call me now. Uh, and a number uh, on it which was uh, you know, a nice uh, billing, high billing number. So all these people thought a friend called and wanted to say hi, uh, happy new year, and they all called the number and uh, someone called Rich. Um, so it's, it's basically the, the uh, high volume thing combined with uh, uh, things like calling uh, and, and, and charge numbers to, to create um, effective multiplication and, and make money that way. And all the public SMS gateways, because SMS sending 
uh, through web servers and, uh, and uh, um, email services is also uh, increasing uh, lately. Um, all these services are being confronted with uh, spammers and uh, people uh, finding ways to automate uh, supposed to be manual entries of SMS messages. Um, they are now even doing the thing, I also saw it in Yahoo, where they may make uh, a, um, a graphic uh, number and then you have to retype that number in a box. So uh, to automate it, you would need to do some OCR or something. Um, and probably people will find out ways to do it. So spam is one of the big problems. Um, as I said, spoofing. Um, source of an SMS message is, isn't worth anything. I mean, everyone can spoof SMS and it's known uh, among the operators. Uh, only the people using it uh, still think that everyone that's sending an SMS is really the one sending the SMS. Um, leading to the ideal, um, you know, more or less social engineering attack. I mean, you can have people uh, jump up and down uh, based on the uh, sender of, uh, of an SMS, just the same as with email. Um, it's, uh, in that sense, it's basically the same thing, only it's even much harder um, uh, with SMS to, to protect, protect this uh, because uh, of the roaming capabilities. I mean, users can be everywhere. Uh, so no one can filter on SMS source or something. There's nothing like that, like ingress or egress filtering like in IP. Um, source of SMS is uh, not to be trusted and uh, basically worth nothing. Um, the only exception to that is for all the users that stay within one SMS, one operator. As, soon, as long as that, that uh, you know, um, uh, controllable situation is there, the operator has a possibility to check who is dialing in and sending his message from where, and you can make sure uh, by using alias uh, numbers that the message don't go outside of your network and also cannot be sent from external networks to your network. So in that case, you have some possibility of limiting uh, um, the, the, the spoofing of the source of messages, but it's pretty hard and I wouldn't build systems that, that uh, depend on it. Um, as I said, spoofing is one thing, but you want to have a reply too. Um, then you get the, the situations where people are sending um, messages uh, to a service um, and, and need to reply to it uh, to confirm their action. So um, in this case, you can send uh, a message to someone uh, asking him for his password and his reply will get to you. So you spoof his, um, his boss or whatever and, and his, your, his reply will go back to you also. Um, and that is a, a strong point for attacking. Um, so, and then another thing is of course the virus. I mean, SMS virus is, um, uh, well, I think the worst thing that could ever happen to phones. Imagine um, that uh, Nokia, uh, who has like, I don't know, 30, 40% market share, uh, if there would be an SMS that you can send to a phone that will be resent to all the uh, numbers in your phone book and then kills your phone. Um, you don't wanna know what uh, the, the damage to Nokia will be uh, if they have to recall all those phones. Um, and the question is, 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 it, is it possible? Um, uh, on the one hand, uh, okay, you have the monoculture, uh, you have uh, the interpreting uh, features of, of the phone, uh, all the, the, the web stuff and the, the, the ro um, ringtones and logos. Um, so that will make it easy. Uh, however, um, there are so many versions of phones uh, and, and embedded systems are typically uh, different from the, the, the software that we are known uh, have known like uh, in, in, the, in the Microsoft world, uh, that it might not be as easy as it looks. Um, generally, it's hard if you have an exploit in, in Unix or in Windows, and you have like to deal with three versions. Um, to get it to work for all the versions uh, is pretty hard. If you look at um, Nokia, I think Nokia has like five to 10 different models, or maybe even more, 10 to 15 different models, and every model at this moment has like five to 10 different software versions. Um, you, you don't update your phone like you would your PC. Uh, you need to go to a service center because uh, they need to do a cryptographic update of your, of your phone 
so it's not so easy to update, but the versions are out there and, and delivered. So um, if you do all the permutations of all the versions, then you can see the problem of creating a virus that's really you know, robust enough to, to kill all the phones. So that's good. So to give a summary of SMS, um, SMS is much more than, than just text messages. It's, um, it's much more sophisticated. It's uh, getting a lot of features. Um, and it's bound to, to open holes. I think the, the biggest holes will be crashing of phones. Uh, I don't think the virus will be that, uh, that likely. Um, it's very much suited to bulk applications. So uh, if you know a scam where you can make money from the reaction to an SMS, it, it's, it's profitable to do uh, like the bulk uh, application and, and find uh, some operators that have a, a, a leak or an open system and abuse it to send uh, uh, a few million SMSs. Um, and the trustworthiness, as far as the, the uh, sender is concerned, is, is uh, worse than, than even with the standard email. Okay, uh, are there any questions on, on the SMS stuff? Okay. Uh, no, not from your phone. You cannot send for, forged and SMS messages. Um, yeah, the, the reason that you can send it from your phone has to do with the way um, your phone talks to the network, and uh, that layer of the protocol uses the, the submit and deliver uh, types that I shown have shown. So there, there's no possibility to set your address. It's inferred from your call uh, what your originating address is. Um, as soon as you start talking to the SMSCs through other means, then you can uh, spoof the messages, or um, you know, and, and yeah, you, you can pretty much be an SMSC uh, in, in, in a lot of places. Uh, I mean, the GSM world is like uh, worldwide, and um, uh, the GSM operators have no way uh, to to you know uh, block people out of it or something. So if you find one operator that's you know doesn't care on your spoofing, then, then you can spoof in the whole network. Or you can send it, but you cannot spoof the originating address. Sure, you can send uh, the Nokia phones, they have, uh, they have an um, AT command, uh, AT Hayes command interface, and you can just send uh, the, the PDUs that I was showing, the, the SMS uh, submit and deliver, you can just build those and, and send them up. So you can pretty much set every bit in the message that you want. No, no. No, because w w when you get in that level, you are in a GSM network, and um, there are issues with the GSM level also, but that's another story, um, because then you also can maybe even spoof phone calls or whatever, so it's in, in that sense, it's SS7 signaling, and you're in that level, so um, that's outside of this scope. So, there was someone in front, yeah? Well, it's not so much that it doesn't uh, time out. It's more that it, it's never, uh, nowhere specified how it's supposed to work in the phone. So there's no one that says uh, you should time out after this or something. So it's completely up to the phone builder how he deals with it. And um, well, generally, if you leave it open, you know how it goes. Uh, people do it uh, or don't do it. And you have to test to see what happens to know what works. So, and it can well be that they don't time out. Or uh, it can well be that as soon as, you know, mem the, the memory uh, allocation uh, sees there's not so much memory anymore that it just discards them. It could be. I have no idea how it works. Okay, no one else? Okay, um, web. Okay, I'll go into a description. Uh, then I'll walk through the protocols, levels that are there. 
uh, talk a bit about the infrastructure issues um, that come up when you start building uh, stuff like this. Um, talk a little bit on WML and WML script. Um, I forgot to say that I changed my uh, presentation uh, a bit, and the biggest bit is in the, the web uh, stuff. Uh, the new presentation is uh, going to be or is already online, uh, so you can download a new one. And it will also have uh, much more information in the notes uh, on resources where you can find stuff. So I extended uh, it quite a bit from the version that's printed and was online before, if it was. Um, so uh, what is uh, web about? Uh, as I said, it's, it's HTTP and HTML, uh, but then completely warped around and converted for uh, small devices. Um, and what they did is they took all the levels that are involved in, in um, you know, normal uh, TCP and, and uh, HTTP and HTML, and um, all threw them together and redesigned it and called that web. So web is everything. It's, it's a network architecture, um, but it's also a protocol and it's also the language. Um, the big difference in the, in the model as we use internet today uh, is the web gateway. I'll get back to that soon. Um, and another thing, uh, the specifications are at the web forum. Um, this is the model that they use. Um, what you see here, is uh, the client, which is the phone or the device. Um, the gateway, which is a computer, um, which is reached by um, using a connection and it can be dialing in, uh, it can be the SMS as bearer, uh, it can be other switching technologies. Um, once it reaches the gateway, it has a special protocol that it talks to the gateway with and the gateway is the one that goes out on the internet and retrieves whatever you want. Um, so they really split um, the tests that normally done in one PC, in two systems, one your phone, and they try to offload stuff to the uh, gateway. Um, what also is happening in the gateway is that they're doing encoding and decoding um, of uh, the, the textual stuff into a, a, a much uh, tinier binary format. Um, so they take that net network uh, uh, topology and then they design uh, a network layer, uh, a protocol stack uh, to be used with it. Um, and what I'll do now is, is walk a bit through the layers and explain a bit what it's doing. Um, in the lower layer, you see the bearers. Um, again, GSM can be used, CDMA, um, SMS is also one of them. Um, I'll start with the lowest layer, which is uh, really not much of a layer if you're using uh, IP. Um, how does it work? Uh, the phone, um, if, if, I'll go back once, twice, um, oh, three times. If you see the client connecting to the gateway, um, actually what is happening uh, is that your phone is just dialing in and doing a PPP uh, dialing connection, PAP or CHAP, and it's just, uh, connecting, connecting uh, uh, over IP. From that point on, um, between the gateway and, and your client, there's just an IP protocol, and you can scan your phone. It's just, uh, you know, it's just IP. Uh, it doesn't do TCP, uh, only UDP, um, and generally it crashes if you use NMAP. So, uh, and if it doesn't crash when you use NMAP, you can use tools like uh, ICIC or ISIC. It's doing random IP stuff. Um, and generally, if a phone receives that kind of uh, data, it, it, it goes flat. Um, well, it's, it's, it's a thing with all uh, um, IP stack implementations. Um, I have never or almost never seen an IP stack implementation that was for done from scratch and was stable. Um, generally, it, it breaks down. Um, I've seen, uh, last thing I saw was uh, uh, Nokia ADSL, and again, it, it just flops over every time you, you, you know, scan some stuff through it or uh, use ISIC or something. Um, that's the problem with all these kinds of technologies, especially if you're doing them embedded. Um, it's hard to do an IP stack right, and especially if you're doing the higher level uh, protocols, and, and generally no one does it right the first time, and no one is testing uh, properly. 
if it works. So again, uh, the WDP layer is pretty much just UDP. Um, it's uh, uh, WDP specifies that it needs a source and a destination and uh, it might do fragmentation and it needs a controllable uh, protocol and they all specified it such that you can use IDP and SM ICMP for it. Um, but as I said, you can also use SMS. Um, I don't know what you need to expect data uh, bandwidth. It's I think like uh, 100 bit per second or something. Um, so the next layer, the much more interesting layer, is WTLS. Um, this is probably, if you've heard of web, this is the most uh, named layer uh, of the web protocol um, because it's providing the encryption and authentication of, of uh, web. Um, if you look at the layer, you'll see that it's pretty low. Uh, it's beyond, below the session level stuff. So it's on a different place than uh, with normal SSL. Normal SSL, you set up a session, a TCP connection, and over that session, uh, there's uh, an SSL uh, connection. Uh, in this case, the SSL or WTLS is below the transaction and session layers. So it's, it's pretty uh, low. Anyway, what it does is pretty much the same as SSL and TLS. Um, it's providing encryption authentication. It has the whole uh, handshake and infrastructure to do um, exchange of a secret. Um, and in 1999, um, I think it was uh, Marco Ioanni Sarinen, I'm not Finnish, so I have no idea if I pronounced it right, um, did uh, 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 quite a complete research of WTLS and looked at the issues that um, what made it different from the normal TLS and came up with like, uh, I, I, there were more than this. I, I just named a few problems that he identified in WTLS. Um, one of them that I don't mention here is that, that they were using 40-bit DES um, where they still had to do the parity stuff so they ended up with like 35-bit DES or something. So uh, completely worthless and not even worth writing down. Uh, in a spec, so pretty uh, sad. Um, things that you see here is uh, they had the, the PKCS um, problem, which is uh, the, the, the error messages that you can use as an oracle, um, unauthenticated alert messages, so you can, you can uh, break off uh, uh, sessions of a user. Um, it, it was not really, um, all, not all the points were as bad, and I think most of them were fixed in the, in the newer uh, specs. Um, but it's pretty much the only uh, work that has been done on analysis of the crypto uh, level. Um, what you can say in general is that uh, you still have the problem that the keys are stored in the phone, which is, you know, one big space. Uh, no phone has like process uh, levels and privilege levels. It's just an embedded system, one big space. Um, if you can get hold of a phone, you can just read out the flash memory most of the time, so you can read out all the data. Um, I have no idea if they even encrypt uh, the key in the phone. Um, however, there are some new standards emerging in the web uh, 1.2. Uh, there's a spec for the web identity module. It's another application that's on the SIM, um, and it's using the SIM as a crypto uh, processor, so it can use the si signature functions and the encryption functions of um, the SIM, which is uh, a big improvement. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, for for WTLS, I think it's RSA. Uh, basically, I think it's RSA and um, uh, uh, what's the other one? Um, yeah, that, that's RC RC five is for the encryption and and, and RSA for the uh, authentication part. So that's basically it. I think it's just RSA with RC five. Yeah. So. 
that's all that's being used now. Also for the WTLS? Yeah, I, I've mostly seen mentioning of RC5. I can't even remember seeing triple dash in. I don't think so. Yeah. This is all. Um, I mean, it, it's set up so that it's. It's. Uh, I mean, it's not fixed, but for the implementation that, that I've seen, um, uh, it's like I said, I would say. But also, these specs don't go from a standpoint that there's anything else but this. I mean, it's for that. The focus of the the uh, uh, web specs is is just this is us and this is how we do it and this is safe and. There's no consideration of other environments next to this, so I don't think that there's any, you know, information on doing shared secrets or for for or crypto for this uh, kind of devices. Um, so um, there was another point that someone told me today. Um, I just saw that there was an issue with uh, web gateways that are now. Uh, have a problem with uh, the the way they uh, certify the certificates of uh, of the server that they are accessing. So the the web gateway um, is, or actually the WTLS, you talk to the gateway. You don't talk to the SSL server or the HTTPS server on the internet. You talk it to the gateway. So uh, they call it the the the, the gap of web or something. In, in essence, you terminate your, your secure session in the web gateway, and then the web gateway will set up another session to the HTTP server or HTTPS server. Um, so you have the problem of uh, no end-to-end uh, -end security um, making a, middle, a man in the middle uh, possible. Um, but I was going somewhere else. Um, Oh, I was talking about the problem that they now identified is that the web gateway is not properly uh, certifying the HTTPS server on the internet. Um, it looked at, uh, or it, it does look at the root uh, certificate, but it doesn't check the uh, certificate of the site itself anymore to see if it uh, matches the, the uh, site that you were requesting. So uh, the, the signed uh, name of the server can be different from the one that you were actually requesting, um, and you will never get a complaint in the phone. Um, so that is also a pretty bad mistake, but that's pretty much the mistake of the web gateway not doing proper checking. Um, the other way, the, the other one, what I said, um, is, is the user interface problem. I mean. How are you going to see that you're secure, or how are you going to explain to your users what to watch? Um, how do you prevent people from sending bookmarks over SMS uh, with uh, your so-called secure site, and actually it's visiting uh, an unsecure site uh, that uh, looks precisely like yours? Um, you know, you, you name your bookmark again uh, like update or something, and everyone will add it and use it instead of your uh, original uh, site. And how do you tell the user that he's not talking to your authenticating uh, or authenticated server? So um, above the uh, WTLS, there's the transaction layer. Um, this is a, a really pretty basic thing. It's, it's about, uh, specifies about three or four packets. Um, and basically is to get reliable uh, connections over uh, an unreliable uh, uh, layer. So what it's doing, it's, it's uh, adding a transaction ID and uh, the server is trying to uh, figure out if you're uh, sending an old one that went missing or are, you, or are you sending a replay or if you are actually sending a new packet or uh, so-called invocation. Um, it doesn't do any security. It, it's really the, the bare minimum uh, of a protocol that you need to do reliable. Um, 
and even then it's, it's not uh, resistant to any malicious uh, uh, attacks trying to um, um, get the protocol out of, uh, out of state. Um, these are the basic packets that are in use. There are three classes. Um, I had them here. So you have unreliable. This is just you send a packet and you don't care. Um, if it gets there, it gets processed. If it doesn't get there, uh, too bad. Um, class one is uh, reliable. So you do get acknowledgement, but you don't get a result. Um, so you only get uh, acknowledgement that the um, uh, packet was processed on the other side. And the second class is uh, uh, reliable, but with a result. So you first get a result, and then you uh, have to acknowledge uh, the result so the server knows that you processed the result. Um, OK, I don't want to go too deep into this, but uh, we did some testing on this level. Uh, we wrote some tools to, to uh, play with uh, a few of the web gateways. Um, and as soon as you can do spoofing, it's pretty easy to get this protocol in a state to do denial of service because you can set the transaction ID to the, to the maximum level uh, while the actual client is still on a lower level. Um, normally then uh, the server would get into a verification um, uh, protocol where it tries to figure out what, you're, what you want to do. Um, and at that point, because you're spoofing, you send another packet um, and you get it into a state that the server th thinks you're in the high packet range, the high TID range, um, but the client actually is still in the lower level. And um, in, that st in that stage, you get a uh, denial of service. Uh, the server won't accept any of the lower uh, TIDs anymore of the client. OK, above the w uh, WTP of the session uh, protocol layer, um, the session protocol is, is a bit of a weird layer because it's uh, both trying to do sessions, uh, so um, maintain a state over a longer period, and at the same time, it's trying to do the whole uh, HTTP GET POST uh, thing in, this, in the same protocol. Um, again, there's no mention of security in this protocol. Um, it's all depending on WTLS. Um, and I should have mentioned that WTLS is just purely um, uh, optional. I mean, you don't need to use WTLS at all. And for normal surfing, you don't use it. So it's only for HTTPS uh, that, that the um, uh, WTLS uh, will be used. So um, that's one of the big problems that I see with the whole web protocol specification. Um, basically, it should be like mandatory WTLS or something to, to create some kind of uh, yeah, reliable protocol. Um, the WSP has a connection less and a connection oriented mode. Um, in the connection mode, it, uh, you get a session ID uh, from the server, and that session ID is uh, the ID that, that ties you together. Um, you can um, have several message types. You can set up a connection. Um, you might get a redirect to another server, uh, so you can have multiple gateways. Um, then you have the methods itself, so get an post and a reply, and uh, there's a whole set of encoding, so all the uh, headers uh, that are in the HTTP protocol are described here and, and how to encode them in the uh, requests. Um, you can suspend and resume a session, um, but um, and then you can have a push. A push is where the server can send unsolicited information back to the client, which is always interesting, of course, in a situation where um, uh, you want to attack a phone. Um, If we look at uh, WSP, um, there's nothing specified on the session ID. So um, I didn't, I, I've not done much uh, testing on it, but I suspect that it's uh, incremental. Um, so again, if you can do spoofing, um, it's, it's not really reliable and probably you can get into sessions and break into sessions and uh, maybe even push data to a client. Um, but I think this is still an area where you could do some research. Um, there has been some research in the reliability of the web gateway handling of, of these messages. Uh, it was part of a, a, a project called Protos. Um, what they did is, is basically have this testing 
uh, tool and environment and they took WSP as a case for their uh, environment and tested uh, several gateways in um, how they could handle uh, messages and um, this was not done with uh, a very, um, how do I say, a predetermined way to, to modify the messages. It's much more like uh, length and overruns and uh, uh, randomization in, in the WSP protocol. Um, but that's what, what the test showed that, that uh, uh, the early f uh, uh, gateways that were out there were pretty unstable. Uh, weren't able to handle weird packets and stuff like that. Just as I said, with the IP stacks for, for embedded systems, the same goes for, for these levels of, uh, um, for the gateways. Um, generally, what you see when protocols are there, specs are written, people start implementing them only functionally. So uh, the conformance spec always say it should do this and this and this and this, and no one is testing, uh, but what happens if I send this and this and this? Uh, all the stuff that it's not supposed to, uh, to do. And what you see is then generally it's still, um, it all crashes on those, uh, then people fix it. Um, Kennel, which is an open source uh, web gateway, um, which is a pretty interesting pro project to, to see how it works and uh, uh, to play around with uh, the technology. Um, you can use it with your own dial-in and your own web phone and not be tied to any telecom operator or anything and play with web uh, if you want. Um, and an example is that that kind of also still has a problem if you um, just max out the, the threads. It, it starts threads for every uh, session that you want to start. Actually, I'm not sure if this should be in the WTP level or the WSP. Um, but you can send, you know, invokes or session uh, connects and uh, the threads go up and then if it's max, um, it just builds out. Um, then we get to the top layer, which is called the uh, application environment. Um, what they did is um, um, first you had the browser, which is, was pretty much the environment. The browser is the, the environment handling the WML and, and uh, talking the, the W. Uh, uh, SP and TP protocols. Uh, what they added now is uh, WTA, which is a telephony application interface. Um, because you have a phone, you have all kinds of functions in your phone that you might want to access, like call out or uh, have voicemail uh, handling. Um, so they define this as another uh, user agent in the environment. And uh, that's how the user environment or application environment developed. Um, Services that are in that environment are the handling of, of the WML, WML script, uh, the libraries that are there for WML. Um, when I start talking about WML, I have to admit, um, I'm not really much into this uh, yet. Um, if we uh, look at WML, it's, it's an XML uh, type of language. Um, uh, it it um, is in that sense, uh, pretty structured. Um, however, it doesn't work like HTML in the sense of uh, frames. Uh, it doesn't have pages and frames. Uh, what you talk about in WML is decks and cards. Um, a deck of cards is, uh, every card is one uh, screen, basically. Um, also different from HTML is that you can talk in variables from one card to another card. So one card can send variables to another card. So you have some kind of uh, uh, low level um, uh, of programming is a big word, but um, uh, interaction that you don't have in, in, uh, in HTML uh, sec. Um, it can handle images, which is also a specific binary format for, for web. And all the WML code is compiled in the gateway. Um, actually, uh, I always thought that um, you can also put the compiled code on your server and have the gateway uh, retrieve your compiled code. Um, I tried to confirm it um, before uh, today, but I, uh, for some reason, haven't been able to, uh, to, to do it. So I'm not sure if it's true or not. Um, why is it interesting? Um, on the one hand, it's interesting that the, the gateway is, is processing your code. Um, it's you know, your WML 
any mistake in the compiling algorithms uh, are vulnerabilities to the gateway. Um, it would be a potential attack to the gateway to have malicious WML and, and you know have the compiler freak out. On the other hand, if you have uh, you want to attack a phone, you do want to have um, compiled WML uh, that is not uh, like modified or checked by the gateway. So if you can get a gateway to download your uh, compiled WML to the phone directly without interference, you have a more direct uh, attack factor to the phone. So that's why it is interesting to know uh, if it's one or the other. Um, WML script, uh, it's called uh, the JavaScript equivalent. Um, however, it's much less than that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in a sense, it's, it's the, uh, the good thing about WML and WML script is that it's so primitive. Um, that means that it's, it's less complex and there's less things to go wrong. Um, WML script is located in separate files. So they are also compiled in a separate fashion from the WML. Um, one uh, scary part of the WML script is that they are building extensions to interact with WTA, the telephony application uh, in your phone. That means um, there are provisions to uh, start calling from WML script. So it pretty much depends um, on your phone, and uh, I've read the latest spec on, on uh, WTA, which has now one big uh, security chapter. Um, it's the biggest uh, security chapter except for WTLS that I've found in, uh, in the web specs. And I suspect that it's because someone got really nervous um, because there were some phones that would do calling without user confirmation. So you could have um, a WML script uh, go call someone without any confirmation from a user that was okay to call. Um, I'm not sure if you heard from uh, the iMode case in Japan where there was a game uh, that called out the alarm uh, number uh, and the whole uh, uh, switch, uh, the alarm uh, system went, went on its belly because so many people were playing the game and, and calling out to the emergency uh, line. Um, on the other hand, if you have like a, a charging number for a few dollars a minute, um, it might also be interesting to have a lot of people serve to your site uh, with that kind of uh, WML script. So now, in the specification, there's very explicit that user confirmation should always be there. And, um, well, that's a good thing. Uh, the question is how many people will uh, actually implement it. Um, so JavaScript bugs all over again. On one hand, yes, um, there will be issues. On the other hand, it's, it's much more simple, um, which is good. <coughs> okay, um, some other general problems I've seen with the web is um, the problem uh, of you know, maintaining a session. Um, because of the gateway that's in between, um, it's very hard for the application builders to know who they are talking to if they're not using basic authentication or something. Um, so uh, there was also no or very limited cookie support. Um, so there was no way to track a user through your site. So what people are starting to do, of course, is encode the session in the URL, um, which is not always safe. I mean, uh, URLs get stored, uh, bookmarked, um, and if that's the, the level that you trust, then um, uh, and especially if it's a site that's plain on the internet, you can all kinds of other attacks. Um, what I've also seen is uh, user identification based on a, a modified web gateway where they use um, the caller ID to uh, figure out who is who. Um, might work in a, in a closed situation, but again, um, in this case, they were passing the number in the URL uh, to the site, uh, which was uh, you know, on the internet somewhere. So basically, if you surf to the site and specify um, the phone number on the URL, you're, you're the user. Um, so pretty brain dead uh, situations. So this is a problem. Uh, I did see there's now cookie support. Um, I'm not sure uh, 
how well it is. And um, again, I think the move to WTLS and especially with WIM where you can do uh, user authentication based on the SIM card, uh, that would be um, basically the only way to do proper use of uh, web. Um, so WTLS, as I said, is, is basically the most things that you see with um, uh, looking at web systems. Um, however, there are also much more interesting things um, because it's all IP. Um, you can just dial in, um, dial into a system and be one phone uh, with your computer. So um, you can simply uh, start uh, scanning from your dial-in, uh, see if the gateway is uh, properly protected or not. Um, you can spoof messages, uh, maybe, if there's no proper filtering as anyone else, um, to the web gateway. Uh, also, the web gateway might be listening all, on all kinds of other ports, or the dial-in may be uh, listening on uh, SNMP or whatever just because people don't realize that, uh, you know, the fact that I can scan from my phone doesn't mean that I can dial in with a computer. Um, generally, the, the fact that we are dealing with phones, people are very, uh, uh, you know, confident that there's not so much you can do with a phone, so it won't be so bad. Oh, sorry. Um, you just uh, called a number um, that you get with your uh, web specification um, uh, and the usage. It depends on the bearer of your, uh, of your web. But all the usage in, in, uh, in Europe now is over IP. And what you do is you get an ISDN line and you just dial in. You need um, V120, so it's a bit of uh, OAP protocol. Um, but you can just dial in with your computer and be on the, on, on the dial in. And there's no way. Uh, what you can also do is uh, use the, the new phones and use the AT interface and just call as a GSM modem and have a data connection. And you set up a PPP call and uh, you're on the dial in. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, what I've seen so far, it, uh, it doesn't need to be, but that's generally you have a dial-in with, uh, with a router in front. And what you should have is, is a router, because you should be filtering there. You should be filtering on the, on the IP that the dial-in line uh, needs to have. You need to filter the, uh, the web gateway from unwanted traffic. Yeah, if you see the router as an access router, and then you have PPP to there, yeah, and then. Yeah. Yeah, you you have a PPP session, and you just get a number. Um, as I see it, you get a number for your web setting, you get a phone number. That's your dial-in, like a normal dial-in. Okay. It works like a normal dial-in. So your phone gets an IP number to the uh, access router or whatever is there. Um, then it depends on the setup, if you have another router to do the filtering or if it's the same system. But your phone is just like a normal dial-in, just like your normal home PC. It's normally dialed in. The only thing is that the protocol that, that the normal uh, gateways talk and that your phone talks is uh, V120. Um, but from then on, it's just IP. So you can just dial in. And you can just, from, from then on, you can just do the scanning. So in this case, you can scan uh, the web gateway. You can see if there are services open. You can see if, if the intermediate router has uh, stuff open. Um, you can try spoofing. Um, the second phase is that you can do, um, if this is a web gateway going to the internet, um, you can surf to your site. So uh, you can set up your, your own web server with 
I don't know what kind of modified uh, content and have the web gateway get that info for you. So um, the web gateway is, is you know, influenced from two sides. Um, now I have to say that I've not seen any uh, attacks uh, that, that use this kind of uh, modified WML or anything. Um, but it is possible. Uh, the good thing is that WML is XML, so it's just quite strict checking on, uh, on correct uh, information. But um, in theory, this is a, is a possibility. And the next thing is, of course, that you can attack the phones. Um, all the phones will be dialed in at that web gateway. So um, if there's no proper filtering, you'll see all the IPs of all the other phones that are on, on, out there. Um, and you can access them. And um, what you'll be seeing is that um, you can do the same thing that you did with SMS, but then over UDP. You just send UDP packets to ports on the phone, and it will be listening on the same uh, services and um, maybe send you know fee cards, ringtones, and whatever to the phone. I don't think it's doing it yet. Uh, I think there's still a difference between the SMS level there and the UDP level. Um, but also, you can uh, if you can spoof the the web gateway, you can access the web gateway. So you can have the phone uh, you know accept data from you. Um, and if nothing else, you can crash it because you know the stack is so bad. So for the denial of service, it's also uh, a problem. Okay, then uh, a little bit on some new stuff that's uh, uh, in uh, Web w, uh, 1 .2. Uh The first is push. Um, all we've seen now is, is really spool. Uh, you get uh, stuff or you post stuff. Um, the, the thing that's uh, really nice with uh, a mobile device that you've in your pocket all day is that you can push information to it. Uh, so they've designed the whole infrastructure to support also push to your phone. Um, again, there's the danger of user confirmation um, because the push specifies all kinds of stuff that, that might be possible. Um, and do I want to have it or do I want to allow it? Um, is, uh, who is the uh, trusted party? There's a link to the authentication in WTLS also, but um, it's, uh, it's a problem with push anyway, uh, and especially on a device where you have a poor use interface to judge if you want to allow it or not. Um, the other one is the, uh, the WTA. Um, as I said, access to phone functions. Um, and the last is the, the WIM. Uh, uh, for the identity module. So these are all specified in, uh, in, w, in uh, web uh, 1.2. Here's uh, a little picture on how the push is going to work. Um, again, they have a gateway. Uh, the gateway is at the operator because you need access to the, the phone uh, on a level. Uh, it's also talking, uh, talking uh, the web protocol level, so WSP is used um, and the, the, the big problem I think is in uh, who is allowed to initiate. So you have push initiators and somehow uh, the proxy gateway is going to have to allow. Uh, there are some um, examples on how the gateway should be able to check lists of allowed URLs or, or not, um, but the, the specs are completely vague on, on how this is supposed to work. So again, um, all the sensitive security stuff around push, um, they only focus on the encryption and authentication level and, and all the areas where you wanna say uh, who's allowed to do what uh, is, is hardly specified. So I think that will be a problem in the future too. So um, this uh, rounds up uh, the web part. Um, general uh, um, uh, points is it, it, the protocol uh, or the whole web thing just mixes too many levels. Um, it's trying to do a network thing, a protocol thing, uh, WML specification, um, which makes it um, a, a pretty um, messy thing to work with and to understand um, what is affecting what. Um, the specs are pretty unclear on, on the security sensitive uh, issues. Um, 
you have a web gateway sitting in the middle, um, which is uh, pretty much open to attack from, from a lot of ways. Um, and I don't think there's very much insight in, in how much you should protect it. Um, and then the uh, user interface interpretation, uh, which is always uh, difficult on the mobile devices. Um, so what will be in the future? Uh, as I said, the combination of, uh, of uh, smart cards and WTLS security, um, that will be uh, big. Um, we'll see a big increase in number of features. So I don't think it will uh, end with the ringtones. So what you get is a lot of interpretation. So that is um, a risk area. Uh, use interface, I, I don't think, uh, I don't see how it will improve except for that PDAs will get into use more and more, but um, phones in itself are terrible. And um, there's this version explosion um, with all the phones, gateways, and uh, you know, web uh, versions, which is also a problem. So that's it uh, for me. Um, are there any questions? Yes. Sorry? Um, it doesn't work here. <laughs> uh, to play with, basically. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.